The Ravens' defense has been the big bad wolf of the NFL for the past two decades. It's never mattered if their offense was any good, or even if the team overall was any good, you could pretty much set your watch to the fact that at least two or three times a year they would completely and utterly annihilate some poor quarterback in a huge win. It happens every season, and 2018 has been no exception so far. Baltimore leads the NFL in sacks by a comfortable margin at 26. They are far and away the number one defense in yards given up at only 270 per game, and individually they're number two against the pass, number three against the run, and number two on third down at only 26.5% which is ridiculous. Overall, this defense is a monster, and they owe all of these impressive numbers to a very aggressive, and in some ways a throwback style in the modern NFL. While many defenses around the league these days are still taking their cues from the old Legion of Boom, where they play a lot of simple coverages, don't blitz a whole lot, and just let their front four do the heavy lifting while the secondary rallies and tackles the checkdowns underneath, the Ravens are doing it differently. They don't just rely on four-man pressure packages to get home, they blitz a lot. And they don't just sit in soft zone all game and force you to throw it to your running back 15 times, they challenge your receivers, take risks, and dare you to beat them. It's a very aggressive defensive style that we don't really see that many teams doing these days, and so far it's done nothing but pay off for them. And I think what makes watching this tape on this defense so intriguing to me, just because you don't see it as much in today's game, is that you can tell that the Ravens are really built to beat up on certain types of offenses over others. Young, inexperienced, slow to process, jittery in the pocket kind of quarterbacks, that's what they really like to take advantage of. This defense preys on fear and confusion more than any other unit in the league by far, and just looking at their sack splits against all of the quarterbacks that they have faced, it's clear to see that Baltimore almost exclusively lives off a diet of fresh meat. Nathan Peterman, Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield, and Marcus Mariota, who is in his fourth year now, yes, but he's still not somebody that I consider a comfortable pocket passer, all of those guys account for 22 of Baltimore's 26 sacks. Over those three games, that's an average of over seven sacks a game, which would obviously be far and away number one in the league over a full season and likely shatter a bunch of records. But in their other three games against experienced veteran quarterbacks that have been around for a lot longer, Case Keenum, Andy Dalton, and Ben Roethlisberger, they managed only four sacks total. That would be the second lowest sack rate in the league this year if also extrapolated to a full season. So clearly there is a difference here in how this Ravens pass rush affects veteran quarterbacks and how it affects younger quarterbacks that still don't know what they don't know. And I want to take you through a couple different plays that demonstrate what I'm talking about here and why there is such a big statistical gap. This was in the first quarter of the Bills game in week one, and ironically it was Baltimore's first sack of the season, but it's also a perfect example of how their blitzes can totally screw with young quarterbacks that haven't really seen anything like this before. The Ravens are in a 6-5 nickel package on third and 11, meaning there are six linebackers on the field and five defensive backs, and all but one of those linebackers is standing up. In addition to that, you've got the free safety Eric Weddle showing blitz off the edge, and the nickel corner Tavon Young is also close enough to be a potential blitzer because the slot receiver is in a tighter split closer to the offensive line. The tighter the split of that slot receiver, the more likely it is that the Ravens will send his defender on a blitz because it's a lot easier for them to disguise it from that close of a distance. So just kind of file that one away and keep it in mind this weekend when you're watching how the Saints are lining up their slot receivers and the distance of their splits. Now, when you look at this alignment, Baltimore is basically saying, we're in man coverage, we've got eight guys that can all potentially come after you, figure us out. Slide protection whatever way you want to, you really don't know who we're bringing on pressure and who we're dropping in coverage, figure us out. And young quarterbacks just can't do that. They don't have the experience, they don't have the pocket presence, and they don't have the ability to process these coverages fast enough to answer them. As Peterman is going through his cadence to snap the ball, watch how the Ravens completely change the picture on him at the last second just to confuse him even more. Eric Weddle is hauling ass to get back to the deep middle while Tony Jefferson rotates down to play a hook zone, and now look at where we're at after the snap. It's not even man coverage with six guys coming up the gut anymore, it's a drop to a cover three zone with a five man pressure instead. And on top of that, the actual blitzers that are coming from the second level are the two guys that you least expect. Tavon Young from the slot, and Tyus Bowser on a twist behind Matt Judon. Weddle's not blitzing, Mosley's not blitzing, and Tim Williams is not blitzing. Peterman has zero idea what he's looking at here. He's got no clue. 
and what's crazy is that the pocket was actually really clean and the blitz was picked up pretty well by the slide and protection, but Peterman still stepped up into the sack anyway because he didn't know what to do when the Ravens dropped out into a zone blitz. Kelvin Benjamin was even coming open on this deep over route, which was the perfect route to exploit this coverage, and Peterman never even saw him. He got spooked, he didn't know how to answer this last second rotation from the defense, and he ran right into the blitz. I'll say it over and over again, youth, inexperience, and fear. That is the Baltimore defense's primary diet. They will find any excuse they can to throw more than four rushers at you because all of their coverage schemes rely on dirtying up the pocket and forcing quarterbacks to hesitate. Whether it's delay blitzes, green dog blitzes, slot blitzes, safety blitzes, loops, twists, anything they can do to mess with a quarterback's eye discipline down the field, they will do. Their whole scheme depends on it. Even the way that they rush the passer with only four guys, and keep in mind that half of their sacks this season have come from four-man rushes, when they come at you with only four, they are still doing it in a way that screws with young, jumpy quarterbacks that have no pocket presence. They typically don't penetrate into the backfield and risk giving quarterbacks immediate lanes of escape in exchange for quick pressure. It's happened a couple times this season, but that's not exactly their identity or their intention. Where the Ravens' four-man rushes really get their work done is from collapsing the pocket with raw power and forcing these young quarterbacks into really tight areas with no ways to escape. If there's one thing that an inexperienced passer hates, it's not having room to move. As the walls close in, they get nervous, they get jumpy, and they take their eyes off of their receivers as they start to look at that pocket getting smaller. Inevitably, as that pocket closes in, even if there is still room for them to find a man downfield and get the throw off cleanly, those young quarterbacks try to roll out into space to get more comfortable, and they almost always take a sack while doing so because the defensive line is waiting for them to run. In fact, they're counting on it. The Ravens do this better than any other team in the league right now. They compress the pocket, force QBs to work with very little space, and even if they are still clean, that compression of space messes with their eyes enough to still help out the secondary whether the coverage is good or not. So overall, taking these rush styles into account, it's not hard to see why Baltimore was able to totally tee off on the Bills, Browns, and Titans offenses. All of those teams have quarterbacks that either can't read defenses, or are still too young to have mastered maneuvering in tight pockets, or they have a quarterback that is old enough to have supposed to have mastered both of those things, but still hasn't for whatever reason. If you don't know how to feel a blitz, if you don't know how to process late rolls in coverage after the snap, and if you don't have a play caller that knows how to expose those blitzes with alignment and motion, well, your team is probably going to get torn to shreds by this defense. That's just how it is. That's how their system is designed to function. But that brings me to my final and maybe most important point of this episode. The type of offense that this defense hurts the most is the exact opposite of the offense that they're facing this weekend when the Saints come to town. There is not a blitz that Drew Brees has not seen before, and there's possibly not a single quarterback in the NFL that is more comfortable in a tight pocket than Brees. And on top of that, Sean Payton is one of the best play designers and play callers in the history of the league, and he's had his entire bye week to study every trait, every strength, and most importantly, every weakness of this defense. This is a coach who is 7-2 in his last nine games coming off a of bye week, and he's at the command of an offense that is basically the worst possible personnel matchup for the Ravens. Hell, just a couple weeks ago in the Saints' last game, their blowout win over Washington, we saw Breeze making throws for huge gains on almost identical concepts to the ones that Mariota was struggling with. While Mariota got nervous with the rush closing in and took his eyes off of slot receivers breaking wide ass open over the top of linebackers downfield, Breeze does not. He's looking for that matchup. He and Michael Thomas have put up absolutely insane numbers this year because of that same matchup and that same route concept. As soon as Breeze's back foot hits on his drop, that ball is out, and it is placed perfectly over the middle for Thomas to snag it behind the linebacker and in front of the safety. It's like clockwork, and they do it every single game. That's the kind of quarterback that the Ravens are going to have to adjust to on Sunday because they're playing against a guy who, for once, literally does not care what kind of pressure they bring or how much they compress the pocket. He's not going to be phased by it. Either they change their style to try to win right off the snap and penetrate, or that ball will be gone by the time they get there. That's why Breeze is the least hit quarterback in the league through six weeks, because that ball is always gone. 
Baltimore doesn't have an Aaron Donald on their team. They don't have a JJ Watt or a Von Miller or a Khalil Mack that can dominate off the snap and generate immediate pressure. They have a bunch of Pro Bowl caliber players that are really, really good like Zadarius Smith, Matt Judon, Brandon Williams, or even Terrell Suggs at his old age, but they don't have anyone who will immediately wreck the play all by themselves. This is a front seven that is maybe more than any other in the NFL, greater than the sum of its parts. The problem is though, the Saints offense is also greater than the sum of its parts, and I think that their parts are just flat out better with Peyton, Breeze, Thomas, Kamara, Ingram, and one of the best offensive lines in all of football. Now, does this mean that New Orleans is going to go up to Baltimore and destroy this defense? No, not even close. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the Ravens hold Breeze to far less than his typical output. but. I still think that the Saints are pretty much the worst possible matchup that the Ravens can have coming off an opponent's bye week. Baltimore is a really hard place to play, yes I'll give them that, but just going off the tape and the numbers, it's going to take a hell of an adjustment on both offense and defense for them to pull this off. And I'll just say this to shamelessly hedge my bets while I'm at the end here. If they do pull this off, if they do make a gigantic adjustment to their style in just one week to stop this Saints offense, despite all of their talent and all of the time they've had to prepare, and they manage to run the ball with Alex Collins on statistically the best rush defense in the NFL, good lord watch out for Baltimore. This is without a doubt to me their hardest game of the year for about 5 or 6 different reasons, and easily their biggest test. If they fail that test, no harm, no foul. It would be a perfectly understandable loss and I would not hold it against them one bit. But if they pass, if they get this win of all wins and make a statement against arguably the most brutally efficient offense in the league, man, good luck to the rest of the AFC because they are all really, really, really going to need it. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. Uh, this Saints-Ravens matchup is going to be insane. I'm super excited for it, probably because it's the best example of strength versus strength that we've seen all season, and something's got to win out. So I'm stoked to see who comes out on top. Uh, as of the time of me writing this, the Ravens are sitting as a two-point favorite in Baltimore on my bookie with a total over-under of 50. It was a little bit lower this morning, uh, but as of right now, at least it's 50. I, I don't know what it's going to be by the time I release this, but either way, it's a pretty juicy line for everyone, to be honest. Whether you think the Ravens are going to win by a field goal or you think the Saints are going to pull off the quote-unquote upset, there's going to be a lot of money on this game on both sides regardless. So with that said, if you have been thinking about maybe betting on some NFL games this season and you want to try to make some extra cash or just kind of do it for fun like I do, maybe even on this Saints-Ravens matchup to start out, you're in luck because our season-long sponsor, MyBookie, is still offering a huge sign-up bonus to all Film Room viewers. Just click on the link in the description below, enter promo code BRETT when you sign up and deposit, and you can get up to a 100% sign-up bonus of up to $1,000 on that deposit. So if you're going to be betting on that game or any other game anyway, you might as well get a bonus to go along with it because it's free and free stuff is awesome. So again, check out the link in the description, enter promo code BRETT and have fun this weekend. As for me on my Patreon page, I have launched a patron only Q&A today for anyone who wants to ask me questions about I mean, pretty much anything. It can be on this weekend's games or the whole season or players or schemes or teams or myself or the channel. Whatever you want to ask me, I'll answer it for all patrons, regardless of how much you donate, uh, even as low as a dollar or two or five or whatever you want to give will access. It is 100% up to you. And all patrons will get to see my weekly picks every weekend as well. So check that out too, if you feel so inclined. I'll be back next week with another episode, uh, potentially on this same Ravens Saints game again, if something crazy happens, just because it's, it's such a super juicy matchup. But if not, I'll find some other subject to cover. Uh, maybe it's time for Derwin James or Darius Leonard or Tyler Boyd to get some time in the spotlight because uh, I've been getting requests for them like nonstop throughout the whole season. So we'll see about that. But uh, anyway, until then, later. <laughs>